develop it into a mixed use site which includes um, flats and a hotel. So it really is uh, changing the nature of the site. It's a <laughs> um, There is a group of us um, uh, who work on a um, trying to um, put together a strong position. Um, and at the moment, we, um, we've had some really great press coverage this week. Um, and it would be really amazing if anyone is interested in helping to support the businesses and the artists that work there um, uh, would have the time to write to the press, then please come and see me. It would be really great to have some letters to the editor to sort of support the momentum that's going on in the press. Politically, people may be aware Father was amazing. 
Mason and when he died the Masons looked after my education and it was between 97 and 103 of us that, that went off. Uh, the school the school closed after about three years due to lack of funding and then we were sent off into quite a, a posh school. Um, and Sonic wasn't really a particularly posh school but it was, it was quite a quite a strict place. Um, so 30 of the Masonic boys arrived in a school in that Pretoria Board of School. And I think we were looked on as quite a strange bunch of people. Um, I kind of started off my education sort of doing what I was told and you know, doing what most people do, sit down and read, pass exams and all of that. And then I suppose somewhere around the third year, I decided find it more interesting to be mildly but consistently disruptive and, um, and after some time the art teacher we all called sex change decided that it would be a good thing for me to work with some clay. So I thought to this I thought well it's great you know another medium to chuck around with people and uh, but instead I, I started to work with the clay and began creating these heads and um, after a series of, of classes um, I kind of felt, I felt as if something very natural was happening that I could do it um, uh, with the clay and I could create colour and create it with confidence and felt that I there, and during which time uh, I was walking through Thailand one day and uh, spied in through the, the, the bookshop window um, a Thames and Hudson book on the series of uh, who I didn't know, I didn't know anything really about art at all, and uh, I, was, I was particularly interested in school and perhaps looking back one of the most important times was actually 
uh, going up to France for three and a half months to to a city called Tulle in the Loire Valley, and um, and again it's one of those things just walking down the road if I chance and I came around the corner and was confronted with this great vision of this Tulle's cathedral, and uh, I remember looking up and just being awe and struck by the beauty, but also by a feeling of one's own home mortality. That's what the, the this image gave to me. Um, and six months before this, uh, I had had a bicycle accident where I went into <coughs> the back of a, an articulated truck and uh, did a little bit of damage. And six months later, I had been in another town and uh, ended up having to leave uh, college and, and go to the hospital for a while. And it's during that time that I began to create uh, these figures, um, which I created initially in wax. There were 25 all together, and, uh, and it, for me it was um, something that I was back in Belfast at this stage, and, and I think that these figures were like a presentiment of Memories of Cornwall. Um, Cornwall for me um, presented the grey area of humanity. Um, something like a visual world, upon it. Um, and, uh, whereas what I grew up in, both politically, spiritually, and religiously, was, the dimension was very black and white. So coming to Cornwall, it was very much a grey area and full of mysticism, magic, symbols, all these things were, were all very, very new to me. Um, so I created these figures and it was a set, set structure and pattern and, and that, they, that they were to go. And I left hospital and, and carried on with this project. And this became, became known as the Dance of the Middle World. <coughs> And uh, it was really the beginning of, of what would carry on as a preoccupation between 1987 and, and 1995. And still to this day, um, the work remains in the studio. And I kind of see it as, as something that's not finished, as I do a great many things. Uh, anyway, I think that unless it's taken totally out of your hands, everything certainly within the studio remains in the present. Um, I don't have this thing of old work, new work. Well, obviously you create new work every day, but the old work can get chopped up, twisted, turned up, and all of that sort of thing. So um, I returned to college. I finished college. Um, during the third year, I started to build the, the, the pedestal for the figures, something in the shape of the lower part of this um, this piece for the middle world. And um, and then uh, I left college, worked across southern England as a restorer and um, conservator of old buildings in sculpture. And uh, then decided after about half a year that really I'd had enough of this, I need to get back to Sculpture, that's what I want to do, and end of story. So I carried on making the model for the upper part of this underneath the archway and just to uh, work through the winter and, and, and all of that. And then I decided to, to return to Cornwall um, to finish the piece, but it, like said, it, it, it carried on from 92 to, to 95. Um, the work, looking back at it, uh, the work, um, I've just written a few sentences here. The middle world was limbo, a meeting place, a waiting room, a still procession, where life, death, joy, despair, light, darkness intersect into chaotic disorder, where time, place, on all, on all form of definition become valueless and thrown out of context. 
The work occupies the twilight zone of the human consciousness, a hinterland where both real and unreal exist. And um, perhaps that can all sort of be um, consolidated into one sentence, um, and it's, it comes from a Seamus Heaney poem called Limbo, that I see the middle world as the cold glitter of, of souls. In 1995, I, uh, I showed fragments of the Middle World uh, in London and uh, received a very good response. And uh, it was all around quite a successful show. And I was invited by the patron Delfina Intracanales to, to either go to Spain or, or go to London. And Spain has the offer of free food and wine. <laughs> seemed like a more glamorous, exotic offer to me. And I would go into London, the offer of London would be two years, and uh, mixing with uh, probably a good many of what were then the young Brits. Uh, it seemed instinctively that, that Spain was something that I had to, to go for, really. I listened to a lot of flamenco and psychomotor <coughs> music in the studio. <coughs> There's just some sort of pull there for me to go. So I headed off in spring 1996 to Casa uh, which was an old medieval prison uh, in a small town called Manilva, not that, flat, not that far from the coast. And uh, the first, after a night of rain and wind, uh, yes, it happens in Spain too. I woke up and walked around the town and saw these wonderful, uh, this wonderful landscape in all directions, stretching up to the, to the, to the mountains and beyond. Uh, these tiny dots, and these were very old and famous black vineyards, um, which they made a particular type of wine called Mosto. And the vines were very old, they were 80, 90 years old. Henceforth, they were very thick and mild and, and quite figurative looking. Um, and for the next while, I drew these, uh, the next couple of weeks, I, I became very obsessed with them, the movement and, and the, their ancientness. And uh, after that, I then started to attend bullfights, flamenco dances, and just generally immerse myself in the culture of Andalusia, and I went to Seville, to the Semana Santa, to Granada, and, and many other places, and, um, and created out there um, a model for my first corrida, uh, which means bullfight corrida de Torres, uh, which is run off I then sadly had to return uh, to, well not sadly, but uh, I returned to, to Cornwall. I wanted to stay in Spain, but uh, life had to, to carry on in another place. Um, and for the next two and a half to three years, I pretended to be Spanish in my studio, <laughs> um, learning Spanish looking at Spanish films and videos of bullfights and many other things uh, to create this piece called 
that carried uh, uh, dreams in red. And these were, this piece was really to do with trying to capture um, the spirit of what I'd experienced during my time in, in uh, Casa Cas de Um And the, the work consists of uh, drum-shaped table three meters in diameter. Consisting of a cast of bulls, toreadors, horses, and dancers um, that are act out particular rituals on the table. And as you can see, the, uh, the figures are lit and uh, by fiber optic lighting, um, which had an interchangeable uh, disc that that shone onto the walls, a bit like a lighthouse that it would shine different colours, which would appear and the projections would appear and, and, and disappear. Um, I'm just thinking, should we have the lights off? Because yeah. yeah. I can't do my notes. <laughs> So the lights, the, the fiber optic lights would project onto the walls, these images, and, uh, and this would take place under the, the drum beat of this new processional music, uh, which incorporated many things, including chains, uh, saeta, which is a particular sort of flamenco that's sung to the Virgin Mary on the, uh, during the Santa Semana, Semana Santa, and um, to create this, 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 this feeling. What was that feeling? Um, well, I think that feeling was something that was, that was very influenced by things such as the Bill of Light and the Flamenco Dance, and strangely by car crashes that were, that, that, uh, car crash crashes and the victims which were televised on, on TV. And I felt that there was this sort of um, consciousness of death was something that I felt you could feel it in the soil. Um, you saw it in, in the Corita, you saw it in the eyes of the Flamenco dancer, you saw it on the TV in the car crashes. Um, but with that there was this celebration to live life and to, to the full and to the age. So I think that this was was what um, the, the piece was was really about. Now, the next four slides um, that I'm going to show you, and I, I hope that they're going to be able to understand Belinda, Belinda Whiting here, who's an um, um, artist photographer, has, has taken. And um, it's a particularly interesting thing here because I think that this, it's a little bit like a collaboration where Belinda has used the subject matter, um, my piece, and, and Made, given it her own authorship by reworking and reworking uh, through the medium of photography and, and, and um, printing. And, um, am I right in saying that? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, but when she showed me the images, I felt that, um, that these images actually Okay. Okay, but it, I'll just 
Have you held it up? Yeah, you can't really see it. It's, it's, I'll just keep on talking because um, we might be able to resolve it, maybe not. But um, I felt that, that, that with Belinda's images that she'd really, really pushed the whole idea of, of, of what the work was about uh, through photographic image, um, pushed that feeling forward. Whereas I find that many photographs that are taken of, um, of my sculpture and, and probably happens to every sculpture, it doesn't translate the sense of feeling and volume and all of those things. I think, I think we just carry on. Yeah, not, not to worry. Right, um, so that was Spain and the Corrida Dreams in Red. Um, the piece was uh, shown in London in Cornwall and indeed last year um, during the origins of the Drummer Show at the Millennium Gallery. In 1999, when it was shown, we found the Dark Gallery um, and afterwards, I, I suppose, I probably suffered from most artists. Disorder, <laughs> um, which I'm sure many of you that make work and show work yeah, feel that sometimes when you, you, know, you have a build up of, of, of your work and towards the show, and then it's all over and all quiet and uh, everything is back to normal. I thought I would be, I had this idea that I would head off to London at this stage, and um, I was called one day. going to be the Eden project <laughs> and uh, so we're going to create this this this, um, this bubbly looking thing in that big pit down there. I looked at the guys and this was Cornwall 1999 and I, and I thought they've just got out of Cornwall. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm sure that they've just escaped from the, the nearest asylum. Anyway, the reality was that 
that says is the space lab did get built in the in the pit and that did become the Eden project. Um, after I agreed that Turned to another meeting, and they said, "We would like you to work about the wine exhibit area." And uh, so that 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 day was, uh, I was given uh, a lot of pieces of paper with stories relating to the wines to take away and read. Uh, stories about Christ turning water into wine, the making of wine. Research that I did, the more I um, became more gripped by the the, the whole idea of, of making this, this piece of work. So I created a maquette uh, based on the back I returned to the Eden Project guys six weeks later and they liked the wax maquettes that were performing some strange right on the on a plateau. Um, which included sex in the swarm, the ripping apart vandals, and God knows what else. Uh, it, it kind of produced a look of consternation and, and glee in, in their eyes. And Tim Smith took a puff of his cigar and said, Don't get run over by a bus, Kill, we need you. <laughs> so soon after the, the, the contract was, was signed and sealed. Uh, it's interesting to note uh, the connection between the last piece that I'd created and, and the rights of Dionysus. Dionysus, great god of the lions, took many different forms, lion, bull, serpent, um, curly hair gel, very out of man. And it's it, interesting for me because I saw the bull as this wild force of nature. Dionysus as, as it became known <coughs> as, um, it wasn't just a sculpture project, it was a collaboration with, Dan, uh, with, with uh, designers and with horticulturists. And in the beginning, um, we all kind of viewed each other with equal suspicion and were very protective about our own, our own area of, of, of research. Um, the vines caught a disease after two years. This is at this point um, we uh, um, we managed to to sit down together and, and, and work as a team, and that meant for me going out to, to Spain researching what. Vibe 
binds actually look like. And that's when I created uh, the 18 bind forms, which exist within the, the, the area onto which the binds were, were grafted. And everything within this area is, has a particular line and structure to it so that it reads as, as, uh, as something quite lyrical as you walk around it, even right down to, to where the, uh, the, the, all the trees are, are placed. somebody brought it to me that day and I kind of felt that that the sort of the overall shape and structure was not that far removed from from that, that picture which I'll come to later on. I don't quite know what happened um, from September 2004 through to, to the following year. I think it was sort of lost time sure where it went. <laughs> it's too long ago to remember. Um, it, it probably was on the bed for Anyway, um, next up, I was invited on a scholarship to the British School of Athens, um, uh, where I spent another three months um, uh, travelling across Greece to all the ancient sites such as <coughs> Delphi, where um, you had access to a lot of knowledge about the past. Uh, everybody there was doing a PhD or was lecturing um, to that standard. And, um, and so you were waking up in the morning to people flying in from another country who were about to deliver a lecture on a particular aspect of archaeology. I drew the, the, this um, quite intrigued by this building. It's it's made out of masking tape and newspaper uh, and and lead pencil. I was always in, intrigued by what would have what would have gone on inside this place. Um, and indeed I was told that that's it within the inner sanctum there was a forty foot statue of Athene. Um, and only the priests were allowed into the inner sanctum to worship her. spirit of the god Athene. And I find that quite an intriguing thought that you know, within 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 a shaped form, man-made shaped form, there was this, this presence. Um, this is a given points I did of a probably three centimetre statue of a child deity. Um, I was kind of spooked out by, by this because it reminded me of um, 
back to that, that image that I saw on the 30th of April 2004, the young grave figure. It's, it, the figure itself had, had some sort of resonance with the past. It felt as if, as if it had been around a long time, since the dawn of mankind. Um, so I return to This was during the time of the, we were well into the Iraq war by this stage, and um, apart from making other works, this was the, the piece that I felt I had to make. Um, when I saw this image in the paper, um, uh, I, like many others, had probably a shared feeling of revolt against the, the war in Iraq. But for me, the actual image itself, uh, because I like to, to work a lot about the past, and in particular about this idea of the past and the present, uh, walking as one, as I call it, with the past and the present merge, um, this, this felt important to make. Um, the piece is, is 17 foot high, 5.3. The actual figure and it's created out of steel, barbed wire, black bailing plastic, black agricultural plastic. The hands are beaten out of steel, and there are uh, three phase electrical wires coming out from the feet. Across the floor is cast a um, pool of oil, uh, which stretches across the floor to about 20 foot. And the floor is, is, uh, has sand across it. The walls are smeared with, with uh, handprints and um, words on the wall um, that relate to, I guess, uh, things to do with freedom and war. Um, but the actual, this is a deceptive image because the, the work was actually, um, the, the whole piece was blacked out. And it was, room was illuminated by a, a, a very low, probably 20, 20 watt light bulb. The room was filled with mist um, from a fogging device, not a, not a smoke machine, but a fogging device that built up this, this atmosphere that created like a smoke screen. And uh, the, the, the sound um, was directly inspired by the vomit that had poured the oil from the, the great tank into the, the pool. It gave this, this sort of low belly gluggy thump, thumping noise. And strangely, that noise was somewhere between a heartbeat and a drumbeat. And this just seemed to fit with, 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 with the piece. And um, the poor chap, the sound engineer that I hired, um, I put him through. He had to do about 21 takes of similar noises to get to the right noise that, that was necessary. The studio was right beside the railway, so you got these wonderful uh, exterior noises merging in to, to this, um, to this, <coughs> to the with the pieces as well. Um, only 800 people saw the work. Um, it was reviewed and received good reviews. 
But I think that the overwhelming thing was one of surprise that people would walk into this room, they'd see the middle world, and then they'd walk through double doors, through a corridor, and then uh, they would hear this thumping noise, um, which was amplified by valve amplification, which made the whole building shake. And then they, this, they saw this, this was um, described as a phantom form. And I say it as, as probably the shape of man's deepest innermost fear, collective fear. After London, he was back to Cornwall um, to produce what you probably have all seen as the drummer. And uh, uh, it's one thing doing creating work for shows, public or private. It's another thing creating a piece of work that's of a large dimension, that's only eight miles from where you live, where it's going to be seen by a great many people every day. And so that was a responsibility not to be taken lightly at all. Um, because I think if there's anything at all, the toughest people really are, are the public. Um, and the toughest job really is whether or not you can, you can please them. Not that making work, you know, one doesn't aim to create work to please, to please people. It's much more about if you're trying to express, I think, but to do it in a, in a good way. Um, the original brief for the drummer was to create something that celebrated the key's maritime heritage. And as I looked into it and went to museums, I kind of felt personally for me that the heritage, heritage didn't appear that, that <coughs> great, or at least there seemed to be a greater task there to celebrate. And that, that task was actually, okay, well here, we, here is true, midway between uh, Saltash and Land's End, it's the midpoint, it's now the city of, of large town. That should be the place to represent something about uh, Cornwall, its people, its past, and the place itself. And I went on a journey of, of I went to mines, went to pubs, to met fishermen, ex-miners, talked with a great many people to find out what is it that makes Cornwall special and different to anywhere else, if it is. And um, I know that 25 years ago, when I first set foot in Cornwall, um, I, th I came out with this one sentence that it's a place where the drum beats differently. And although that sounds quite young and poetic, um, I think that was my way of explaining there's something different about this place. And after a good deal of thought and discussion about it, I came to the conclusion that perhaps what makes Cornwall a little different in that when you cross into Cornwall, there is this feeling that it feels different here. Um, the, the conclusions I came to is the farthest point from the country's administrative centre. It's out of Berlin, it's surrounded by sea, on the edge, and with the main historic industries being fishing, farming, and tin mining, uh, I felt that, um, which were all in, in the session, um, it felt as if it was a land that, that through the years uh, there had been a lot of hardship, and with that, a steady determination to get on and to survive whatever the prevailing circumstances may be. And I looked for in, an image or an icon that might portray that very idea. Uh, and I came up with the idea that it should be the, a drummer. Because uh, one thing that is certainly interesting and distinct about Cornwall is that drums are used to celebrate So it 
seemed that and this is how the, the idea of the, the drama came about um, the idea of the, the, the figure um, I'll, I'll come back to that in a second so the, the actual, this actual idea was also very much inspired by um, a series of images that I uh, saw in, in the Troll Museum of the miners working in the ground. And I just came across this, 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 this strong feeling this, that life was, was very hard. And this is something that I was going to celebrate in the world. Um, the ball, the idea of the ball, uh, as you probably saw, So this is an image of, uh, of the work in, in progress and the casting of it. And um, during the time of making it, it it's, um, I think sometimes when you talk to people, you get the impression that these things are just sort of either brought, brought out of the warehouse or um, just appear out of thin air. Um, it's probably one of the hardest pieces I've had to make. Um, it's probably not the most contemporary looking but I didn't want to create um, something that was a contemporary artwork and what we know as a contemporary artwork as very interested in producing something that, that actually didn't belong to any time at all. Hence, that's why it doesn't have any clothes. Uh, or certainly one of the reasons, which seems to be something that's been a point of contention with some of the public. <laughs> um, during the making of The place that I created in, which was a, an old quarry works, um, and we were up the scaffolding. Um, there was a lot of heat that came in and was sweated during, during that particular summer. Then the piece went off to, to get cast in, in London, and uh, you didn't have very much area to, to work in, and you had to make split, split second decisions as to how the figure was being reassembled on the ball, the right angle that it should, uh, it should be assembled on with relation to the, the posting structure below. And indeed, whenever it was being, um, whether it was being installed at Lemon Key, I had something like probably 10 people around me, half of which saying, this is terrible. You know, what will kids think? And, and you were having to make this decision as, <laughs> as to where exactly that should go within the millimeter. So it was kind of quite a hard job, really. Um, I put this image in because um, this is uh, the icon on the on the drum is misfire. Everybody, in fact, and it's actually a very important symbol that ties the piece back into Truro. Um, I was at a loss a lot of the time to really try and find some very interesting reference that would tie it back into Tro. Tro is, is um, and I came to the conclusion that Tro has historically uh, served as a, as, as a, as a commercial centre for a rural community, but also <coughs> it served as a standard town where tin was weighed, sold and valued. And the symbol of the, the pelican was used, also the lamb and the flag. And in Truro Museum, 
there's a symbol of the land flag, and it's very similar to this motif. Neither does it look like a flag nor a land, but certainly what it does look like is something very ancient and pagan. And uh, if there's anything about Cornwall that really stands out for me, um, the thing I bring that I do is that it's, it feels very much a pagan place, and very, um, what, what does that mean? Something that's tied very much to the seasons and very much to the earth. And it felt fitting that this symbol brought all of those things together. After the drummer, I returned to London. Um, and uh, as you may imagine, it's you know, working on one piece. Um, well, you could say dedicated for the two years on and all from the moment of conception to the time that it was um, put into place and all the interviews that you had to go through and justifications and all of that. Um, I was ready to go to London and um, experiment with a new medium. And uh, it's a piece that I, I tend to work a couple of years ahead in my head. And uh, this is a piece called Soul Snatcher Possession. So um, I went about going to to a charity shop to buy clothes, stuffing and clothes and all of that, and started constructing these figures. That idea was inspired by a visit to Paul Rego's studio, um, the painter, Port Portuguese, London Portuguese painter, um, who's very uh, celebrated. And when I went into the studio, I was met by a entourage of, of uh, soft dolls and people and pillow men and people like that, who seemed very alive. So that idea of, of the clothes is, 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 is something quite inspired by that at the time. Um, however, the, the actual piece itself um, is very much about, uh, well, it's, it's, it's about the taking of life, soul, or spirit by the powerful, be it in commerce, the corridors of power, or on the street. So it's very much about that, 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 that parasitical um, relationship between the powerful and the less powerful. And this is something, and it's also inspired by something that, that I felt whenever I was in London and I met with certain situations, I realized that the art world does not escape this, this, this dimension of, of, uh, of abuse. So the piece consists of eight large and life-size figures um, um, onto which uh, bulk clothes and pillows and stockings, stuffing, constructed into metal frames. And there's a scene that goes on uh, between uh, the victim, victims and the perpetrators. I showed it in London recently. Uh, this was the last show that I did, uh, and uh, it was actually called Soul Snatcher Possession. But called Soul Snatcher Possession by the gallery. That wasn't the agreed official name that, that, that uh, um, the gallery had gone ahead and, and decided to use that title, but it wasn't the it wasn't my first choice. My first choice was why bother with the truth when the myth is more important? Why bother with the myth when the truth is more important? And it's very much about, um, well, does truth, does the truth really matter um, in the world that I was dealing with? Because it was being fabricated, fabricated and manipulated and twisted and turned. And at the end of the day, you were asking yourself, well, you know, the facts are just used twist and turn things and, and I think this is something that's that's probably used in every facet of society within the corridors of the world. And uh, I'll just finish um, by saying reflection of all that, thank God for President Perry's <laughs> 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 So there we go, I'm finished. <laughs>
Thanks. <laughs> um, any good questions? Uh, I was working, uh, interestingly enough, when I got back from London, I was searching for a large studio and I'd gone around the industrial estates and somebody had just bought a plot of land quite near to where I live and it's the, the action, that action, what, became, what is now my studio was a, a, a large shed that was completely blown apart by the winds over years of dereliction. And I, I walked in and I said, you are joking. <laughs> and they said, in six weeks time we'll have this up as a fully functioning studio. I didn't really believe the owners. And, um, but right enough, in six weeks time I returned and the studio was looking absolutely wonderful. And then I took it on and still have it to this day. And it's up uh, in the hills of Maeve. <laughs> <laughs> What was your response to so snatch of possession by uh, by the art world? Or um, well, a lot of people visited, and uh, a very good response in that that they got they got it, they got feeling from it. Um, the gallery would would tell me over and over again that people would walk into the first floor and they'd see these two relatively. Um, light-hearted pieces called Pregnant Fairy and Ketamine. And I guess they expected to walk upstairs and find similar. But the piece is the piece is quite heavy going. I think in terms of what it gives over, it's it's, um, it's claustrophobic and it's it's about nasty stuff. So people would walk up and then come down and kind of walk out like this, with the mic open, and then out, but, you know, it got a good response in terms of what it was trying to put across. It's in my studio, and it will be shown again probably 2014, possibly next year in Cornwall. Um, have you grown to love it, or is it still a presence in your studio? Um, it's undercover, but it's, you know, as I say, it, it's... Uh, it's when I was working on it in London, it's probably the only time that I've come away after three days of long installation on it. I felt very <coughs> depressed because of what it gives over. It's it's um, well, it's a very it's a piece about very serious issues. Um, it's about the taking of life and soul and spirit by the powerful. What made you show that with Catherine and the Franklin Parent? Um, I think the Pregnant Fairy and Ketamine, the light-hearted pieces, they're still serious pieces, but and a good deal of work went into them. I think I needed something to balance and to lighten, lighten to balance the the show, and. Um, I mean, all three pieces are very imagined pieces of work. Um, and, yeah, that's, that's all I can say. Do they exist as one sort of trio, as it were? Where no, they, they don't. Or they say, oh, no, right, they, no, they, no, they don't. Um, they're three distinctly different pieces. Um, Ketamine is inspired by um, a festival scene and myself and a friend had managed to impersonate, we pretended we were journalists, and we managed to get into this festival after half an hour of flagging it. And it was a you know, special ticket and all of that. And I was just standing around with my friend, and I said, so what's ketamine like? And you probably know ketamine is a horse tranquilizer. And uh, I just at that moment, uh, there were these two young people dressed as elves with long pointed hats, <laughs> completely, completely off their head on ketamine, and one had this long needle, 
and he was pointing it over in the direction of the, well, his, his girlfriend, I imagine, and her nose was coming down onto the, this little spoon on the end of the needle, like a bee with its proboscis onto a plant, really beautifully. And, and I creased, actually literally creased over onto my knees with laughter. It was just one of those wonderful moments. And this, this scene just come, kept breaking through to me time and time again, the whole weekend. And at the end of it, I said, Graham, one day I'll make this piece called Ketterman and dedicate it to you. <laughs> Pregnant Fairy uh, is just one of those things that landed in my head. We've, we've just got things that ideas land in your head and, and it landed in my head and I thought, well, I've never seen a pregnant fairy depicted in, in sculptural form and I kind of thought, well, I wonder how we would procreate through the centuries. <laughs> said a lot about Spain, I'm just wondering where, where that's influenced things. I think, um, I think Spain really opened me up to, that, to the world of colour and shadow. Um, the bullfight, bullfights took place the, uh, at, at six o'clock, five, six, mm -hmm. bang on time, at a time when the, the sun is low. And so, in the arena, there's shadow, beautiful shadow, and I think, you know, with what's distinctly different between the middle world and the bullfights, there's colour and, and shadow, and uh, perhaps movement, and that edginess, and sort of a journey to the subconscious, perhaps, more so. casting a dark democracy, man on fire, those pieces are very overtly political. Yeah. But um, I think that all work has a political message in it. Um, yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, and if a good example of that is the rights of Dionysus, you know, which on the surface, of course, it's about the recreation, the contemporary recreation of Greek mythology. But really, what is it about? It's about humanity losing control in a ritualistic state. It's about that sort of that drive to the edge and what happens beyond control. And funnily enough, the, one of the last pieces was, I didn't mention it in the talk, but one of the last pieces uh, that, that I did create after the star figure was actually censored. And it's a, of a head, and it, the head was was actually inspired by um, an Orpheus mythology, and the head of Orpheus was ripped off by the followers of Dionysus. Anyway, I decided to stick it on a pole, surrounded it by uh, seven uh, rabbit heads as well, um, and that head uh, had to come out of Eden because it started to cause such a problem with the, with the people there and it was during the times of the first beheadings in Iraq. I think it was Ken Ring Ring Big Ring. Um and that was the idea, you know, that I, I actually think that that work was never about one thing. It's never about mythology, it's never about this and that, it's about many different things. On the surface, it might be more overtly about something else. The political work is also about spiritual matters because it's inseparable. Mm. Belfast, yeah, I do want to produce um, the, 
a piece that's about Bloody Friday, um, which is an event that happens on the, I think, the 14th of July or thereabouts in 1972, with the IRA uh, let off 22 bombs within one and a half miles and 90 minutes after each other. You can imagine what mayhem that produced. This is something that few people know about. This, this, this side of the water and throughout the world, we all know about Bloody Sunday. Mm -hmm. And I think that if there is to be any true reconciliation, that has to be revisited. I have problems with it, obviously, because it's about very deep and, and it's about troubled times. And um, you've got to ask yourself, could this piece be the reason for somebody killing or beating up somebody else? Um, so yeah. You started off with the devil and the pro board, and in in limbo, which that part of no longer exists. Do you feel that the color that has been taken on the dark and it can become a much better thing for it? I miss it terribly. The idea of limbo. I think. Um, it just it was a place, you know, kind of in in Doctrine, in Christian Doctrine was it was kind of a place where you you might I'm just thinking about it as a but when it was taken out about twenty years ago out of the out of the doctrine. No, I it was feel taken it, out of the doctrine. Yeah, the doctrine. But I don't I don't know what kind I don't know what you know, I don't worry about them at that kind of thing now. But I find in uh, I find that um it I think it's um I think it, it kind of got handed back, but I was very indignant that there was a good bit of limbo. And uh, <laughs> I thought it was probably the best we could do, you know. It was kind of in a hazy place rather than kind of uh, having a vision of God if you're you know, really good or you go to hell if you're really bad. But it can kind of, you can't get into this foggy place if you're probably, you know, <laughs> badly in. <laughs> but well, I'm, I, I, from the Catholic point of view, I don't know much about them other than it's the place of unborn children, and obviously it's more than that too. Well, the definition is the limbo, what can I say? The souls of the just who died before Christ were in limbo, are in limbo, waiting for the redemption. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I think, I guess that, that applies to us all. <laughs> Um, I think that's, that's it's quite interesting talking about the middle world because recently a book has been produced called Dance of the Middle World and it's a book about physics and a physicist that has identified this place in physics which is unmeasurable where things don't add up and, uh, and it's really interesting I tried to get in touch and wasn't able to and but I would try to get in touch with the publishers. And I think that it would be some coincidence if they had managed to, to dream up that title, The Dance of the Middle World, which is something that, that, um, that I coined in, in, well, in 1987. Um, and, and it's probably somewhere out there on the internet, I imagine. Or well, maybe it isn't, because strange things have happened. At the moment, <coughs> everywhere I go, there's something that says the angels share, which yeah. is the amount of, they put so many gallons of stuff in to make whiskey. Yeah. No matter how do, a certain percentage of these 2.85 was landed, missing, got missing. And uh, it seems to turn, it's always consistently missing in, in, in whiskey. And I went to Dublin and I found a called the angel share. I think it's found that there's a plate called the angel share. And, uh, I got a book called I was present at the time of the street of the English. And uh, you know, you just don't know what it's going to be kind of kind of kind of thing. But fair thing you started out. <laughs> well or oh, maybe it's just one of those things that's you know, I think that people can be working about the same thing. Completely different places, but the 
Sculpture. I think it's mentally attacked. I think it's mentally taxing. Physically, I guess it is, but whatever you do is physically taxing. But yeah, sometimes it can drain. But I guess, you know, if you were working in Tesco's or that's to yeah. on the till, you would have something more to complain about, I imagine.
Since our chairs, the Premier Arts Festival, we have a new festival called Starting Up Next Year, next July, and uh, we were just got some good news for uh, artists and makers and practitioners, etc. So, Steve, where you go? Yeah, if you haven't heard us yet, um, the volume is all together. Um, we've been gifted quite a large sum of money to form an arts festival next to July. Um, Based around Perry, but for artists in a few different countries as well. Um, we tied in with Sight Scenes uh, called Elliot Book Festival, which doesn't seem to be happening next year, so it's hard. No, it's um, not. They're coming down to the uni, and uh, they're coming under the umbrella as well. Um, there will be notices put up. We're asking for proposals from anybody on anything. What we've covered so far is a public piece and the world's smallest ice cream festival, which is proposed. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you'll hear more about it later, but I'd like to hear from anybody. Uh, yeah, the 17th in the town hall, we'll be having a, a general meeting just to make all the announcements and give you the dates and lay out the proposal forms for you all before what you want to do. What you'd like to see. Thanks for listening.